Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ken Baker with Better Bricks Education and Training. Glad to have you here tonight. Good to have all those folks on the web here tonight. I hope there's a bunch of you out there um, because it's going to be a great session. I'm not going to introduce Dick. I'm going to let B Brad Aker do it because Brad set, that, set it up to get Dick here. Although I saw our speaker last year at the ASHRAE conference, I, I helped them put that together and um, I, I set I, t I think I told you a couple weeks ago, I, s I sat through his presentation and loved it. I loved it. It was very informative. So um, I'm very glad, you're, very glad you're here. On behalf of the Integrated Design Labs, um, University of Idaho and Bozeman, and on half, behalf of um, Idaho Power, Northwestern Energy, and the USGBC, I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight. And, um, we have one more session this year. I'd like to remind you about that'll be next week, December 10th. It's one that was canceled October 28th and is um, coming back. And I don't have the title in front of me, but it's David Goldberg. It's, uh, also cooling reduction okay, it's also cooling reduction strategies. And I think it will get into some really good uh, case studies. So come back next week. With that, um, thank you again, Brad. Introduce Dick. <laughs> I guess we'll do the, do the second round of introductions for Dick. Um, I was really excited to be able to get Dick here, um, those ASHRAE members that might be in the uh, audience. Um, saw his talk uh, last year at our technical conference. If you weren't there, uh, come this year to the ASHRAE technical conference. It's a great thing. Um, but I wish I could call um, Dick a colleague, but he, we're so far away we don't get to work together too much. But, and now he's retired. so. But uh, I hope we can learn a lot of wonderful things tonight, and I'm really excited for this talk, and I hope you are too. And don't forget, next week, these, will, these two talks will piggyback really well together. So thanks, everyone, for coming. OK, that's enough of that. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate the introduction. It's great to be back here. Uh, my wife and I had a chance to move to Boise, I don't know how many years, 35 years ago. and I've. Every time I come back now, I have regrets. It's such a beautiful uh, environment in downtown. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice to be back. Um, how many of you were at that ASHRAE session where I presented? I think that was in April this year, actually. How many of you remember better than I do what I said? <laughs> probably everyone. <laughs> um, I'm probably going to be a little rusty here because I did retire and then my wife and I went off on a four month trip with lots of bicycling and you know all the blood was going to my muscles and not my brain so it's this is I appreciate Brad's getting me getting me back into this uh, area that I have been so passionate about for so many years but I will apologize if I you know if I'm a little slower than I probably was at the ASHRAE show but it is time to start thinking about cooling for next year and for many years thereafter because we've, with the kinds of cooling systems we've been installing in the West, we've been creating lots of problems for ourselves. And it's time to start correcting that. So I want to start, and this is a little bit of a review of a presentation I made for ASHRAE. I think it's always good to start, you know, to set the scene for what you're going to say. This is, though, after the first few slides, a, a bit different. I'm focusing on a couple of, of technical possibilities and opportunities that Brad suggested would be of most interest. But I want to summarize the status quo for cooling. And in the West, we're basically at the mercy of the national manufacturers who don't differentiate much by climate. And there's quite a bit of opportunity, therefore, in our drier climates. We also have elect electric rate structures which don't really uh, foster our movement toward these new systems. Some of them aren't entirely new, but they are new opportunity systems um, because of the rate structures. Particularly in residential, there's no time of use rate typically. There, there are some experimental time of use rates in different parts of the West. I happen to be on one at home, which I really appreciate. I can use my photovoltaic system to sell electricity back to PG&E at about 30 cents a kilowatt hour in the daytime. And then I have a little pump that runs at night that basically does all my cooling and it costs me 8 cents a kilowatt hour to run that pump. So it's a, it's a great opportunity, but not all electric utilities in the West let you do that. 
In the non-residential arena, we do, with our typical demand rate structures, uh, offer a little more opportunity for taking advantage of diurnal temperature differences, but typically the demand rates aren't as high as they should be to re reflect reality in terms of what daytime uh, cooling systems use and, and how much they really penalize us overall in our electricity network. We also really aren't being penalized at the moment for the climate change issues that are coming. So I think what we'll see is that there's uh, an opportunity and it's going to be increasingly apparent in the economics of our electricity environment and our overall political environment. So, you know, this slide really is kind of a duh, obviously thing, but surprisingly, many people aren't really aware of it, that, it, that it's, it's cooling that's driving our electricity systems. It's true nationwide, but it's most true in the West because we have such significant day-night temperature differences here. And the result of that is we have very spiky cooling loads. If you live in Miami or Atlanta, you know, your air conditioner might be running 24 hours a day in the summer, and it's a, a pretty long cooling season when that's true. But in the West, there are lots of days, summer days, when you don't need to run it at all. And then in the hottest weather, maybe you only need to run it in the afternoon or maybe only from lunchtime to 9 p.m., and then it's done. So we have very spiky loads. And, and as a result, I mean, this is Nevada Power. I should probably have gotten one of these for a utility up this way, but I imagine it's fairly typical. And what we're looking at here is a 24-hour uh, system-wide load profile for this utility. And this yellow band is the year-round average. And as you would expect, you know, it's lowest in, in the wee hours and it builds through the day such that it's highest in the dinner hour range because that's when, you know, everyone's home cooking and the, the factories and, and uh, retail outlets are also still using quite a bit of power. So that's, that's the worst time. This dotted line, though, is their July average. And you can see that it's much higher. And it's also shifted a little earlier in the day because of the, the outdoor temperature profile. But this difference between the average and the July is what is the capacity that they have to have just to handle the peak load. And if we could get rid of that, you wouldn't need to build new generators for decades. And think of the advantage of a system where you have a much more levelized electricity load. It's like any piece of equipment, you know, if you can have it running more of the day, it, the economics are a lot better. How many, how many factories are gonna buy a new piece of equipment that they only operate for a few hours uh, a year. And that's the way the, the peak load generators are in some climates. So why are changes coming? Well, the public utilities commissions are beginning to recognize the real cost of, of these lousy cooling load factors. And I'll get to an example on the next slide. We also, I think, have people in the energy industry who are starting, even at the Department of Energy, who are starting to see the need for climate-optimized systems, which the manufacturers would rather not market and distribute because then they can't build the same volume for any one product. We also see that there's been so much energy, uh, intellectual energy invested in lighting and some other applications compared to HVAC, which has been largely left alone, or at least we don't see broad-scale introduction of new technology, energy efficiency technologies for HVAC, that there's a greater opportunity right now for HVAC. We also are seeing the world community mobilizing for climate change, and a lot of that energy can be applied in the cooling arena. This graphic here, I'm supposed to use the pointer, uh, is just showing, what happened there? Just showing a conventional air-cooled vapor compression system where on this side over here, you're using warm air to cool, to remove the heat from the system. And what comes out of that is even warmer air. And that's, uh, 
you, we're paying an efficiency penalty for not using water and in particular evaporatively cooled water to cool that condenser and that's one of the great opportunities that we have. So I mentioned that in the in the west we have drier air and that is offering us significant opportunities. This map is showing the average or the mean rather dew point temperature lines for August. It's a little bit old but the weather hasn't changed that much. You can see where we are up here. It's in the lowest dew point temperature range of about anywhere. So we ha have fantastic evaporative and and sky radiative opportunities in the Central Valleys in California, which are in the 45 to 50 range on, on this map. Look at what you have up here. It's an even greater opportunity. And Denver and the mountain cities, as you follow these ISO lines around, all have the same opportunity. So issues equal opportunities is the message here. We have these large day-night temperature swings in the West. And what that is what causes the poor load factors that the electric utilities experience, but it al also offers us lots of opportunities. And thermal storage is, is one of those, either in the building and the, the thermal mass of the building, or in separate thermal storage reservoirs. Water is my favorite, but there are also phase change materials and rocks and, and earth mass, all of which potentially allow you to, to store cool in other words, to discharge heat at night to a mass that then you use to cool the building the next day. This is an ice energy system. Some of you may have seen this product. It's produced in the Denver area. It basically allows you to build an ice block at night that gets melted the next day to cool the building. Another issue is our low outdoor humidity or gives us an opportunity Right now, the issue is that we aren't using optimized equipment. We're using equipment that's designed to work well in the, in the southeast and the more humid climates. We're applying it in a climate where there's an opportunity to do much more. So evaporative and radiative cooling are opportunities that we have in spades in the west, and we don't have enough technology available right now to, to get us the start we well, I guess we can get the start we need to be making on this opportunity, but one of our functions at the cooling center is to try to increase the opportunity by bringing more products into the marketplace. So I am retired, but I feel like I'm still there when I get to make a presentation like this. The Western Cooling Efficiency Center at UC Davis, I founded it actually as the, as the initial director in early 2007. I was following a model that, uh, that UC Davis, though, had implemented before with the California Lighting Technology Center. And our, our mission is pretty broad. We're basically uh, established to identify technologies, conduct R&D, spread information, spread the word, uh, implement programs working with partnerships to try to reduce the cooling system electrical demand and annual energy consumption in the western U.S. And there wasn't a center around that was really focused on this need and opportunity before the UC Davis Western Cooling Efficiency Center. And it's off to a really good start. It's very well funded now. That's the staff as of early last year, and it's larger now. Mark Modera, I was lucky, though. My challenge was to replace myself as soon as I could, since when I took the job of starting it up, I declared that I was, that my wife had declared that I was going to be retired soon. And so I was lucky to find Dr. Mark Modera, who was for years at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and then uh, took off from there to implement a a new energy efficiency technology uh, called AeroSeal. I don't know if any of you have heard this, but it's, it seals ducts from the inside. And Mark started that up and sold it to Carrier and worked for Carrier for seven years and was getting a little, he's an entrepreneur at heart, I think, and was getting a little fed up with the big corporate environment. So we caught him at the right time. And he's really, he's had the WCEC on a strong growth curve and uh, the staff has grown significantly. There's an opportunity there now for another person, so if any of you are interested in 
joining this mission. See me after. Um, but the way the WCEC works is mostly by working with affiliate members. And the utilities are among our strongest affiliates. We were lucky to start up in an environment where the California utilities are already supporting these kinds of partnerships that try to accomplish mutual goals. And our, our three investor-owned utilities in California, PG&E, Southern California Edison, and SEMPRA, which is the umbrella organization over San Diego gas and electric. So those are the three big market arenas in California. And then SMUD is, is uh, a municipal utility, but it really serves the other major population center in California, which is the northern portion of, of the Central Valley. So these uh, utilities have really provided strong funding for the WCEC, but it was also very important in getting this started to bring manufacturers into the fold. And we were lucky with that too, in that we've been able to bring in some of the major manufacturers, Carrier, Lennox, Train, but also a number of smaller manufacturers that have very interesting products. So part of the WCEC role has been kind of to play Cupid between the big manufacturers and the little manufacturers and try to partner them up. These major manufacturers don't so often anymore develop their own products internally. They kind of wait for someone else, some innovative company to start something up. And then when its market share is big enough to bother the big guys, they buy them. And so we're, you know, we're trying to help that process along. And we've had some success with that already. So you probably don't know that many of these smaller firms, but I'll mention some of them as I, as I go through the presentation here. There are also some contracting design firms. Uh, Butler is one of the largest HVAC contractors in the U.S. They are headquartered in Sacramento, but they work up and down California. You probably haven't heard, even heard of them up here. Davis Energy Group is my old company. I started that uh, in 1981 with some other people. It's a, a sort of an unusual mechanical engineering consulting firm that does product development as well as design of, of HVAC systems and does a lot of energy analysis too as a service to both utilities and building owners and, and builders. And then very important supporters, some of the California agencies, particularly the California Energy Commission, um, they obviously fund a lot of work in California to try to bring new technologies into the marketplace. And then the Department of General Services in California is the major uh, state owner of buildings in California. So they have prototype op opportunities, field test opportunities. And of course, when a technology is ready to roll out, they have a lot of buildings that can use them, um, both in new and retrofit scenarios. And then, Two of our biggest supporters have been these retailers, Walmart and Target. Um, when we started up, it looked like if we wanted to get a lot of early play and get some early successes, that working with these chain retailers, if we could, would be really beneficial because they obviously own lots of buildings and they have very high cooling loads and they typically operate some of their buildings 24-7, they're always, the seven is always true for these chain retailers and uh, the, the daily cycle is typically 16 to 24 hours depending on who and where. So there are those two benefits that they have high cooling loads, they, they pay big utility bills, big electricity bills. So if there's a technology that they determine is ready then they can roll it out very quickly. But we also saw with these chain retailers an educational opportunity because if they're willing to place kiosks or display information about prototypes or field tests or rollouts of new technologies, that educates the public. And uh, the public isn't just, uh, you know, they, day-to-day -day consumers buying products, almost everyone goes into a chain retail store at least once a month. And some of these people are decision makers with other firms and building owners that can use 
the equipment. And uh, of course, some of this equipment that you can install on chain retail facilities, facilities may have retail applications as well. So anyway, we saw a lot of gains in focusing on the retailers initially, and that's worked out pretty well. Goals of the center, uh, our major goals that we established early on were long range, although time goes by so fast, you know, it's only two decades now, and we thought we had two and a half when we started, but next year's 2010. But for new, new buildings, our goal was to, uh, by 2030, to achieve net zero peak cooling demand, so that all new buildings built in year 2030 wouldn't impose any peak electricity load. Imagine how useful that would be to the electric utilities. You have to combine some renewables in almost every scenario to make that work because in any building where you're trying to precisely control the temperature, you can't accomplish this goal with completely passive systems. You have to store some cooling somewhere and, and bring it in, meter it in with some, some little pumps or fans to keep the building at a steady cooling comfort temperature. And then 50% reduction from 2007 baseline in annual cooling energy use. And that's pretty easy to accomplish actually in new buildings. Probably the more challenging thing though is in existing buildings. To get all of today's existing buildings to a performance level that's half of what we're trying to achieve for new buildings by 2030. Um, time, again, time goes by so fast and there are so many buildings out there that have so many different configura configurations and economic constraints that getting all of them up to that 50% level of new buildings by 2030 is a challenge. Probably a greater challenge than the new building one. So what the cooling center does is it advocates advanced cooling technologies that are optimized for our western climates. And I probably shouldn't take the time to go through all these bullets. Some of them are obvious pieces of our role at the cooling center. But I like to explain this valley of death term because for new cooling technologies that aren't coming out of a major manufacturer. What so often happens is a new technology is successfully prototyped, it's put out there, it's proven to work, and the advocates or the implementers of the prototypes have no idea in the world how to take the next step and what it takes to get to the next level. So that's the valley of death. And Part of our role is to structure utility programs and structure associations with larger companies so that when these pro successfully prototyped technologies are visible, that then there's a mechanism to take them to the next step, which is uh, early production, pilot production, and then if they're successful through that phase, then volume production, but it's that pilot production phase when the costs of producing them are much higher than, the, than what they're competing with. It's, you know, to go out and buy a conventional rooftop unit or a conventional vapor compression residential air conditioning system, it's just astonishing how inexpensive they are and how value engineered they are and, and how many moving parts you get for the dollar. And now you bring a new technology out that may be simpler to look at, but the small company that's trying to get that into the marketplace has, uh, has trouble getting the money and has probably a lot invested in getting it there and they can't afford to try to compete with the conventional products that they have to. So there has to be a way to get across that valley of death. Okay, I've flogged that horse pretty hard. Um, the WCEC also actually conducts R&D on new uh, technology opportunities, some of it pretty basic and some of it very product related. And there are actually are some new technologies themselves that are coming right out of the cooling center. This picture over here, by the way, is a, of a, a semi-production line for a new water-cooled residential air conditioner that's being produced by Butler 
Corporation in the Sacramento area. It's a very attractive version of a technology that's been tried a few times before, but we think this one's better engineered and with that swoop de doo it's better looking too than the things that have been out there before. So uh, we have high hopes that this one is going to really succeed in the marketplace. And then there's a range of outreach technologies, uh, some of them web-based and, and some of them just getting out there and visiting with people. And then um, there's actually the first two are web-based, but the WCEC is gradually building a catalog of energy efficient cooling systems that we think are ready for the public to see. And, uh, and obviously it's important that you don't wind up with egg on your face from those examples. So you, because you want to be a source of information that people can have confidence is really ready. And so it's, uh, you know, we have, and especially University of California based, we have to be really careful with that. So it's not a huge catalog now, but it's growing. There's a technology portfolio that we've developed that we, and we have a very uh, detailed spreadsheet that shows how this group of technologies in the California marketplace can accomplish our 2030 goals if implemented in the volume that we project they can grow. I'm not going to show you that whole portfolio or anything, but what I have done here is highlight some of them that I, in working ahead of time with Brad, uh, want to feature today. Last, when I was here for the ASHRAE presentation in April, I tried to say a little bit about all of these, and instead today I'm going to go into some more detail on these uh, if new efficient rooftop units that are coming out in response to the Western Cooling Challenge, which the, the WCEC is running, and then look at some general retrofit technologies as well, and then I want to talk a little bit more about Radiant 4 cooling that is gaining some headway, thanks in large measure to a lot of time that Walmart has put into applying it in their new Western stores. So first I want to talk about the Western Cooling Challenge. By the way, uh, I hope to finish in time here to leave a considerable amount of time at the end for questioning, but don't hesitate if you are afraid that we'll get too far past something that can uh, and, and would get lost with where I'm going next to ask a question at any point. I'm happy to, you know, stop the flow if there is any here and, uh, and deal with questions on the spur of the moment. I think it's important that we make this as interactive as, as possible. So the Western Cooling Challenge, we started this, uh, I believe it was July of 2007, we announced the challenge. And it was actually the idea of the chief mechanical engineer of Walmart, Jim McClendon, who was on our board of directors. And he had an experience where Walmart felt that they could economically justify more efficient rooftop cooling units for their applications nationwide, but it had become kind of a race to the, to the bottom price-wise. What we didn't see was major manufacturers coming out with new super high efficiency products. They had reached, the manufacturers had reached the conclusion that buyers were always shopping for price rather than shopping on the basis of cost effective energy efficiency. And so we just didn't see very much evolution and the energy efficiency ratios were just kind of hovering around 10 for the major manufacturer rooftop units. And these rooftop units are typically applied, as you see in this market size, to around 70% of non-residential floor space in the, why is this way over here? Western US, and why did I play around? That Western US is supposed to be over here, but anyway, um, so it's a big market. And of course, the bigger the market is, the more excited the manufacturers are about uh, developing a piece of equipment to serve it. But so here's Walmart saying, we need, you know, we need higher efficiency equipment. And Jim McClendon was going around as one of their biggest customers uh, trying to convince the manufacturers to work with Walmart to develop a higher efficiency unit. 
And he finally succeeded with one manufacturer, Lennox, and what came out of it was the Lennox Stratagos line. And now the, some of the other majors have come out with equipment that virtually matches the Stratagos performance. But it was a real struggle for him to make that happen. So his idea was, okay, you guys at the WCEC, you want to focus on the West, how about running a, a competition or a program that offers manufacturers the opportunity to develop a new unit that's, that targets the West with significantly higher efficiency. And that's what the Western Cooling Challenge is about. And our goal was to elicit from manufacturers units with 40% lower annual energy performance and peak demand compared with the units, the, the units that meet the DOE standard and are being applied in the West. And what, what could we bring to it? Well, we could bring market share by aggregating retailers and others who would promise to buy these units in sufficient volume to make it exciting for the manufacturers. And we have both Walmart and Target who are saying, yes, we will buy these units if you make them. And then we also have the opportunity to bring utilities in to offer incentives. Remember I talked about pilot production and how even when you have the better widget, you have to be able to price it well enough that it is cost effective in low volume. And so we can bring utility incentives to bear, at least from our member utilities. So far we only have California utilities and we're hoping that the cooling center can achieve its overall goal and bring more of the Western, util Western electric utilities into the fold so that this incentive pool grows. So far that hasn't happened yet. Anyway, um, those utility dollars, uh, if they appear to be substantial enough to close the gap, are a major piece of the excitement that our work offers the electric utilities. Another thing that's happening right now Basically, I think because Walmart and Target went to the Department of Energy and said, uh, we need some help, is this Commercial Building Energy Alliance that's mentioned here in this last bullet. This has achieved some stature now, and I think they have uh, more than 35 chain retailers that are members of this national alliance. Now, they're not focused on the West. They have a national scope, but it is an organization of which most of the participants have stores in the West. So we think through that organization and mechanism, we can take advantage of this opportunity for Western specific technologies. <clears throat> I'm taking too long to say some of this, so I'm not gonna go through the numbers here, but, I, but we, we did establish a very specific set of performance criteria that challenge respondents have to meet. So far, there's only one that has passed this set in a lab test, but there are others coming. And unfortunately, we have kind of a, a bottleneck because our testing laboratory, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado, which is one of the federal labs, can't test the bigger equipment. On this prior slide, I should have pointed out that the challenge is open for systems in the three to 30 ton range. These, the bigger retailers, they use a lot of 15 to 20 ton units. And in Walmart's case, they use a lot of 30 ton units as well. They use fewer of the smaller ones, but throughout the West, there are a lot more smaller units in use than those mid-range units. Anyway, NREL is only set up now to test units up to about seven tons. So we haven't been able to test the bigger units that are really of more interest to our major retailer partner. So that's a little bit of a, of a sticky wicket right now that we're trying to get through. But I should say that this one important, I won't go through all the numbers, but this maximum supply humidity ratio basically requires that you have a compressor on board. 
There's some really exciting new indirect evaporative technologies that I'm going to talk about a little bit. But in the peak conditions in California, which is where the biggest market in the West is right now, you can't use, at least with what people are achieving today with indirect evaporative systems, you can't provide comfort in the very peak conditions. You can come really close, but this 0 0.0092 humidity ratio requires that you have a vapor compression system on board. It can be much smaller than the one that would be there with a conventional rooftop unit, but you, still, you have to have it. So these are hybrid units, what I call hybrid units. They're a combination of evaporative and vapor compression technology. Cooler Auto, how many of you heard of Cooler Auto? Quite a few, that's good. They have a really exciting indirect heat exchanger that has allowed them to show incredible results in this and easily achieved our criteria for the Western Cooling Challenge. And they only have a five ton unit. So it's really smaller than the, than the major retailers really want right now but it can be scaled up and we hope they will. But this is their, their five ton unit on the stand at NREL being tested. There is another technology, and, and well, I'll go on to Cooler Auto and HiPAC. HiPAC is a product coming from Munters Deschamps Davis Energy Group, which is, Munters bought Deschamps Technologies, which has been a real leader in advanced indirect evaporative technologies in the US for years. Munders is a large international company. They are probably as, as big internationally as some of our major domestic manufacturers are nationally. Um, but the, this HIPAC unit, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these. But there are, uh, Train and Lennox have also committed to participating in the cooling challenge, but they don't have product in submitted for test yet. Did I jump by one? <clears throat> I wanted to, I won't go through all of these either because it starts to look like small print, but um, one really important point about the Western Cooling Challenge and about our uh, sort of preliminary intelligence about it, uh, and, and uh, I guess it, it was our preparatory brainstorming as we decided looking at knowing what we know about the major they were unlikely to tool up with brand new designs for the challenge because they're all very busy trying to upgrade to to new refrigeration protocols all changing to to uh, 401 and their and they have some major expenses involved with that and meeting a slight upgrade of DOE standards. So they're unlikely to do something entirely new for the challenge. So what we did was establish our criteria that we knew would achieve our goal of 40% improvement, but such that the Stratagos unit, the Lennox Stratagos, which is the, was then when we started this work, the best of the available rooftop units could meet it with some add-on basically with the dual cool approach, which I'll show you as a field retrofit system, but it's something that could certainly be added to a manufacturer's product in the plant or even sent to the field and retrofitted on new equipment. Because we wanted to be sure that major, some major manufacturers could participate in the challenge. We felt if we didn't have majors participating, the utilities were less likely to get excited about offering the incentives because they'd be a little they quiver a little bit about only offering this to some new startup, smaller companies. So anyway, that's probably enough said about this. I'm going to be talking about the technology options. Schedule-wise, uh, it was announced in July of, of 2007 with a sort of a longer range schedule that said you can start, we're going to have our laboratory ready to start testing in April of this year. That happened and that field testing could begin in August of 2009. Actually, some units went in the field, one unit went in the field before that. And then in January of this coming year, shipments of compliant products can begin. 
Sorry about the slides here. I mean, they're, they're all right on my screen on my Apple, but when they <laughs> somehow when they get over to a PC, uh, PowerPoint doesn't behave exactly the same. But I think you can read this and figure out what it's about. This happens, this rough tip, that's Mark Modera, who's my replacement. And this is uh, one of the first strata, Lennox Stratagos units off the line, which we had placed on our new office when we set up the cooling center. So this actually was placed there before the Stratagos line was announced. And it's been a very effective unit. So status are six manufacturers participating, it's quite a range of designs that are in and being promoted. They all use evaporative cooling. In fact, they all use indirect evaporative cooling in some way. And I don't know how many of you know what indirect evaporative cooling means. How many of you do understand this term? I've been slinging it around quite a lot, most of you. So uh, you know what I should ask is how many don't, but people are always embarrassed after they see that half the people do. So indirect evaporative cooling just means that you can cool indoor air without adding any moisture to it. If you're using a direct evaporative process, you are adding moisture to indoor air. Now a cooling tower is a direct evaporative process but it's indirect from the standpoint that it's cooling a vapor compression system without adding any moisture to indoor air. Um, and most of, uh, of the technologies here do directly evaporatively cool the condenser air. So, okay, vapor compression system, you've got the evaporator, which is cooling the indoors. You've got the condenser, which is discharging heat to the outdoors. We don't care too much if we add moisture to that because it's not going to make people feel sticky indoors somewhere, hopefully, unless so much of it's going on that the, the whole environment is, is more humid. But we're a long way from that, and it is unlikely very much of that will occur even if we convert significantly to evaporative cooling of condenser air. So I want to talk about Coolerado and HiPAC um, briefly here. The Coolerado was the first challenge unit to complete the lab test. This isn't their unit, this is a blow up of their heat exchanger. It's got a bunch of semi-horizontal plastic plates in there and, and basically these indirect evaporative heat exchangers, the best of them are plate type. And when I say plate type heat exchanger, what's going on is you have alternating passages between some sheets, typically they're plastic sheets because you need to avoid corrosion with uh, this water-based process and the plastic sheets are thin enough that you still get very good conduction through the wall of the plate because it's so thin, but you won't, you know, it's not going to rust away over time. So you've got a dry air stream going through alternating sets of passages and you've got a wet air stream that's being evaporatively cooled going through the other. That cool stream is cooling the dry st stream but adding no moisture to it. That's, you can do it with with pipes too, but the most efficient systems use parallel plates. So this is their system, basically uh, outdoor air or a mix of outdoor and return air goes in this end. Some of it is used to slowly feed a multi-stage wet plate system and that air comes out the sides. A smaller stream than went in of dry air comes out the other end and that's what goes to the space or goes to an evaporator coil to be cooled a little more and then go to the space. But I don't know, I didn't focus on our EER criteria to meet the challenge, but the goal was a sensible EER of 14 because the sensible EERs of conventional equipment are down around eight. When I say sensible, I'm talking about just the dry cooling portion of it, uh, ignoring the the latent cooling, the moisture removal that so often in the West we don't even need, but it goes on because that's the way the equipment works. It gets the, gets the coils in the evaporator cold enough that, that moisture condenses on them and you throw that cool water away and you didn't even need to take it out and it's, it's using 15 to 20 percent of the energy that the system is using. Anyway, we want sensible cooling. We want to cool dry air. We don't need to dehumidify in the summer. In most conditions in the West, unless you have a lot of indoor moisture sources. If you have an assembly and a lot of people in a room that are, that are sweating, then you do have to do some latent cooling. But a lot of applications you don't. Anyway, they achieved a 20 sensible sear and our goal was 14 
and our goal for the annual test was 17. They hit 41. <laughs> These are expensive now, but with utility incentives, if you have an opportunity, specify one. This is a good product. This is a field test unit now that's in SMUD territory. Sacramento, SMUD is the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and it's performed well there. They, they call this unit the H80. Here's a diagram of how it works. It brings outdoor air in here, and it can work entirely with outdoor air and use no return air. In that case, you're exhausting some air from the building. But in most applications, it's smarter to mix some outdoor air, which is the ventilation air, and some return air. You get a mixed air that its conditions are somewhere between the two, obviously. It goes through the heat exchanger. The working air is thrown away, but it's pretty cool coming out of those side passages. This shows it on top just for the diagram, but remember the wet air comes out the sides. Throw that across the condenser for the vapor compression system. You'll, it'll be much happier working with 72 degree air than with 110 degree air. Its efficiency is much, much higher. It's not as much air as the normal condenser would, would get, but it's a much smaller compressor-based system than you'd normally have operating, so it's enough. The air then that's come through and been indirectly evaporatively cooled, we're getting this air that was 110 degrees and actually was mixed with return air at 78, down to 66, just by the indirect evaporative process. We'd like it to be 55. We put it across a vapor compression evaporator to get those last 11 degrees out of it, and then we supply it to the space. And there might be a little dehumidification going on there in that evaporator coil if it needs it. Is that all clear? Am I moving too fast? People here generally understand the vapor compression cycle? Great. So that's the Coolerado. Uh, it's a really exciting product. And again, we hope that now that they've had this success with the five ton, that in time, as they build some market volume, that they'll bring out larger and larger units because they're probably can, they can probably sell more tons of that total than of the five ton, even though there are lots of small units in demand. I can, um, and sorry, I went by that criteria. We are requiring, oh, I'm sorry, I should repeat the question. Question was, can you talk a little bit about the water consumption? And obviously, in the dry west, water is an issue. Um, but what, where I come out on that is, we consume in the West so much more water for agriculture and there's so much opportunities to use water more effectively in agriculture that the little bit of extra we're going to use in buildings for these processes is not so great. There's also a very interesting NREL study that shows that in most of the Western states, when you look at water consumption to cool electrical generating equipment, which is being used to supply the electricity that's running cooling systems, you actually save water when you directly evaporate it in these systems as compared with what we're doing otherwise. Now, there are some little tricks in that analysis that could cause us some concern because they are looking at evaporation from the reservoirs as one of the sources of water use for electricity. And these reservoirs have multiple purposes. They don't just generate electricity, they provide recreation, flood control. So that issue has been raised. But the difference is so large in some states that even if you just look, if, if you just look at the amount of water that you can say is dedicated to electricity generation, the result is the same. So it's a, that's a very good question. We established a target for the Western Cooling Challenge of four gallons per ton hour of water use. That's less than is used for cooling in most of the Western states per this NREL study. The, the Colorado came out at about 1.8 gallons per ton hour, so they did very well in the test. 
And that's part of the test that's conducted at NREL. The Munders High Pack, this was initially developed by my old company, Davis Energy Group, in conjunction with the Sham Technologies, actually a, a Virginia-based company, and then they were bought by Munders, which is headquartered in Arizona in the U.S. There was funding supporting development of this high pack unit coming from the Department of Energy, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, and they went through two generations. The first generation was a, developed a 10-ton prototype that was moderately successful but needed some more work on the new heat exchanger. The second generation, the prototype, is a 20-ton unit. This is the first prototype. It's been operating at McClellan Air Force Base in Sacramento going on five years now. It looks kind of prototypical since it's got galvanial exterior, but it's also a sort of unusual rooftop unit because it has this low section and then it has this higher section where the indirect heat exchanger is. It's, it's functioning somewhat as a cooling tower. And there were some objections to that two-level look, split-level look. So you'll see the second-generation unit is really a big box, but it's bigger, but it has twice the capacity, too. Like the Colorado, it, it combines evaporative and vapor compression technologies, uses an indirect heat exchanger of a new design, applies evaporatively cooled water to the condenser, and it has a relatively, new, relatively unique plate type indirect heat exchanger. It doesn't match the performance of the Colorado, though, but it is quite a, quite a bit larger. This is the 2009 field test unit, on, which is now operating on a new Target store that opened just in October this year in Davis, which is near Sacramento, and it's where the cooling center is. And this is kind of typical of Munder's equipment. It's, you know, it's much more robust and use, uses double wall construction, which few of the major uh, lower cost rooftop units do. But it's fairly attractive. It's kind of interesting that it has this hole here. That this is the curb that is, surrounds the holes down through the building where the supply and returns go. This is just a, a support for this, what would otherwise be a cantilevered evaporative cooling section that's off the end of the indoor section. The high pack saves energy by using a variable speed blower. I haven't talked very much about the opportunities for saving blower energy, and if I talk maybe faster, I can. Otherwise, I'll have to hold that for questions. Um, but it, it pre-cools ventilation air reduces the condensing temperature, and then uses low pressure drop components, which is one of the opportunities to reduce the energy that's used for blowers. I guess I should make the major point that typical rooftop units, as they're used by the chain retailers, they use more energy annually for blowers than they do for the compressors. And that is a little surprising. At the peak load time, the compressor is the major user of electricity. But these units typically supply some ventilation air, so they, and they use constant speed blowers. So those blowers have to operate at a steady speed through all occupancy hours all year to provide the ventilation air. And therefore, on an annual basis, the blowers often use more energy than the compressors because the compressors only run in response to cooling loads. So there's a big opportunity to save blower energy. And Walmart figured that out a few years ago, and they've gone to dedicated outdoor air rooftop units, which they buy from Munters. Uh, and, and those three big units on a, on a Walmart supercenter supply all the ventilation air, and then they have a whole field of, of smaller rooftop units that are just responding to heating cooling loads. They can go off when there's no load, and there's a lot of the year when there's no load. There are a lot of operating hours when there is no load. So they can cycle on and off. They still have constant speed blowers, but annually the blowers use a lot less energy that way. It's a very smart strategy, and we're going to be seeing more and more buildings and particularly retailers going to that strategy. HIPAC also has a high-efficiency water heater on board, which allows it to save energy in the heating season. 
This is a high pack heat exchanger. Think back to that cooler auto. It's quite a different design. It has vertical plates. And in fact, here, I should use the pointer. Um, outdoor air comes in through this upper half of this face, goes through these plates, oh, sorry, actually turns 180 degrees and comes out here. So there's a panel that seals up tight against this line. Meanwhile, the air that's going through the wet passages comes in through the bottom, through a plenum that this, unit, this heat exchanger sits over and comes up vertically and then turns and exits through the, the top half of the face that we can't see here. And then water is admitted into the wet passages here and drains downward into a sump that's under it and is recirculated. So there's somewhat counterflow heat exchange here, which is why this heat exchanger works so well. You've got air taking a long course through here. Uh, and on the other side of the plate walls, you've got air taking a somewhat longer course here. So compared with a traditional cross flow heat exchanger, which would just have air going through this thing horizontally and the other air stream going through it vertically, you get better heat exchange. So it's achieved 90% effectiveness in lab tests and it has pretty high capacity for its width. But the main benefit of this heat exchanger, despite those advantages below, is that it's made with a high speed production process. When you buy food at the supermarket that's in a clamshell container or you buy a new tool at the hardware store that's in a blister pack, those are made with a, a process called inline thermoforming. And uh, it's very interesting to see this equipment work. But an even better application for inline thermoforming is making these plastic plates because you can just do a fan fold thing with an inline thermoformer. These plates are fairly intricate. You can't really see it here, but they have a lot of features on them that guide the air and mix the air and, and keep the paths separated. And so if you can make them fast and seal the edges quickly with a fusion process, you can make these heat exchangers at a much lower cost than, than they have traditionally been made. You don't see that much out there right now with these, with these efficient plate type indirect heat exchangers because they're expensive. They're handmade, it's hard to seal the edges of them, and it's all changing. So those are, that concludes my comments on these two new rooftop units that are coming, that are most visible now in response to the Western Cooling Challenge. We'll see more over time. And there isn't a, really a deadline for the manufacturers to get their challenge units out. It's just that devil take the hindmost. We expect that the units that are out there first are going to have the early market share and be able to build. So there is some pressure on the, those that don't have their product in for test yet to get, get on with it, get it out there. I'm going to talk briefly now about retrofit options and specifically about dual cool. And the opportunity here mostly relates to traditional rooftop units that cool the air in the building and they cool ventilation air that's being supplied into the building. Both those air streams cause, and cooling of those air streams significantly cause utility peaks because just cooling the indoor air has this condenser that's working in an outdoor air stream that gets very hot on the summer afternoons. Meanwhile, supplying ventilation air, we're taking air that's very hot and cooling it to indoor temperatures. So if we have processes that can attack both of those problems and respond to both of those opportunities, then we can significantly reduce peak demand and the load on the utility grid. And meanwhile, we can reduce cooling energy consumption as well. But it's mostly about demand with these evaporative opportunities on, that can be retrofit on rooftop units. So I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to talk about dual cool here. I just want to mention flash evaporative technology. It's coming along. 
the idea is that instead of having a, an evaporative precooler, as you'll see with dual cool, you use a pressurized process that makes a mist that goes across a condenser coil. You really can't apply that easily to ventilation air because you don't want to be adding moisture to ventilation air typically. But if you have a process like, a, like the refrigeration units that Target and Walmart and grocery stores use to cool the food products that they're selling, that's the, all of the energy op savings opportunity is at the condenser and flash evaporative is really promising. But so far, the technologies really aren't out there yet. We know of three different systems, though, that are probably going to emerge in the next three years. So you'll see that flash evaporative technology. What really should happen in the future is that the buildings, retail buildings and office buildings that have a whole field of rooftop units, each of which supplies ventilation air, what should happen is those should be converted so that a few of them supply ventilation air, 100% air, out ventilation air, or if they don't perform well in that condition, 70 to 100% outdoor air. And the rest of the units should be converted to recirc only so that the blowers don't need to operate during all occupancy hours. And in that scenario, you would apply this dual cool technology just to those that are supplying ventilation air, and if it comes along as we think it will, the flash evaporative technology then would be applied to the condensers of all of those, all the rest of that equipment, refrigeration equipment and non-vent air rooftop units. So dual cool is just a retro, an add-on system for rooftop units that evap directly evaporatively cools the condenser and it indirectly evaporatively cools using the same pre-cooler, the ventilation air. It's been around for a few years. It's not been picked up by a big company yet, so there are only about 75 units out there, but there are some things happening now with support from the WCEC. I think we're going to see this going much larger in the next few years, and it definitely is, is cost-effective. Um, with the utility incentives that are in place now in California. Significant energy savings, 500 to 1,000 kilowatt hours per year per ton of rating. Demand savings, 25 to 40 percent. And the more ventilation air that's being supplied by the rooftop unit, the higher that number. So 100 percent outdoor air rooftop unit, 40 percent savings are, are achievable less if it's only, you know, in the 20 to 25 percent outdoor air range. Longer equipment life because the vapor compression system now is, has this pre-cooler on it, and that pre-cooler means that it's getting cooler air hitting the condenser coil, so the compressor-based system thinks it's operating in 75 or 80 degree air instead of 105 degree air. It's that sustained operation at hot, high temperatures that creates the most wear on the system. It's pretty easy to retrofit. And uh, one of the real attractive features of this approach to retrofitting, there are some others that I'm not going to take the time to talk about now, is this one doesn't involve invading the refrigeration system. You don't have to open a refrigerant line to retrofit this technology. It's strictly external to the refrigeration system. So uh, I think I'll get on to the schematic rather than, but this is a, attached to about a 40-ton carrier unit, so it's one of the larger installations. And most of what you see is the pre-cooling coil in front of the condenser coil right here. This unit has a vertical condenser coil. Lots of units will have an inward sloping coil, and we'll see some of those on a subsequent slide. But over here, a ventilation air pre-cooling coil has been added in conjunction with this uh, with this condenser air pre-cooler, and this has a sump. So as water feeds down through this evaporative pre-cooler, it lands in a sump. The sump water is pumped up through this line and over through this pre-cooling -co coil, and that cools the incoming ventilation air that's coming in through this hood, and the warmed water that leaves that coil comes back and is distributed across the top of the evaporative pre-cooler. And yes, you've slightly reduced the performance of the pre-cooler by warming that water, 
But by the time the water drains down through to the bottom, it's about the same temperature it would have been anyway, and so it doesn't have as much impact as you might think. Where do the demand savings come from? We really want to focus on the demand savings in this session. Well, it varies a lot with the climate, with the percent of outdoor air, and with the, uh, with the building and how the building functions and requires cooling. But I'm just, these are some number ranges that show you how that 25 to 40 percent uh, is generated. And most of it is efficiency improvement, which results from pre-cooling that condenser. The 4 to 10 percent is what you get by pre-cooling the ventilation air. So it's not the majority of the demand savings, but it is a significant number. The other thing that happens with dual cool is you can reduce the blower speed because as you add this system, you get more out of the compressor-based system than you did before, so you can run the blower at a lower speed to deliver the same total cooling, and that speed is what it runs at all year. So interestingly, when we get to a subsequent slide, you'll see that the energy savings results mostly from that blower speed reduction, not from the efficiency improvement for the compressor. So here's a schematic that shows very simply how this works. You probably got it from my description before, but here's the pre-cooler that's in front of the condenser coil. Water is flowing downward through this uh, media-type pre-cooler. It's a bunch of cross-corrugated cardboard but it's a very well-developed de product. Munters is actually the major world manufacturer of this product. Celdec is their brand name. So then a pump that's associated with a sump is pumping that water up through a pre-cooling coil that's at the indoor air, the outdoor air intake, uh, and that air then will go into the system and mix with return air and be supplied into the building. This is just a condenser fan here that's pulling air across the condenser. So. Again, it doesn't add any moisture to the indoor air. The energy savings, this is what I was uh, trying to get to before, is that, uh, you, you know, you to, under today's rate structures, you justify this system economically mostly based on annual energy savings, less so on demand reduction, unfortunately, because the demand reduction is the biggest bonus for the electric utilities. But in this particular case, which is at one of the lower outdoor air fractions, 25%, uh, you're reducing cooling energy use by almost a third, but more than two-thirds of that is coming from the blower speed reduction. So that, again, gets us back to that point that on an annual basis, it's the blower that's using most, more energy, not the compressors. Um, so improved efficiency is the smallest of the three sources there. This is a recent installation on the new Target store in Davis, which is also where that high pack is. You can see the Target has partnered well with the cooling center so far, but we're, we're looking at 20 ton units here, each with a, a dual cool on it. And these are Lennox units that have a sloping condenser coil. That's why you see this stainless steel shroud here that's enclosing the air path. The pre-cooler that's seen here has to be vertical. So, uh, you know, we have to enclose that air inlet air path. And implementing these is pretty easy. You add the pre-cooler and the vent coil, some piping. You have to bring water to the unit if it wasn't there, and often it isn't. And then you reduce the blower speed. Those are the three key steps in adding a dual cool. And Status, uh, it's produced by a company in Vacaville, California right now. It is a patented product. There are about 75 units out there serving about 3,000 3, tons of air conditioning equipment. And Integrated Comfort is working on a new flexible design. Right now, these are basically custom designed for the rooftop unit, and there's a myriad of different rooftop unit designs out there. So there's a lot of engineering involved in making sure the thing fits when it gets to the field. So they're working on a unit with flexible sides uh, using roofing membrane sides that allow a standardized unit to be coupled up to many more different rooftop units without having to customize them. 
and that will reduce the cost, which will further increase the market. I was going to talk about radiant floor cooling now, but you know, I used to be a college professor. So my first few lectures, I didn't have any idea how I was going to get through 50 minutes. And now I can't say in two minutes uh, something that I could say three times in 10. So I'm behind schedule. Um, what should I do, Brad? Should I go on and talk about radiant floor cooling, or would you rather break now for questions and come back to this if there aren't? OK. Well, this is, a, this is a real favorite of mine. I've been an advocate of, of radiant comfort indoors, both heating and cooling, for many years, and was fortunate enough to be able to build an all-radiant house for our family 15 years ago. And uh, we've really loved living with it. And we have radiant cooling from above and radiant heating from below, and that's really perfect. But what I'm going to show you here is a lot of work that's been going into radiant cooling systems for slabs. Uh, and there are a lot of advantages to radiant cooling, even from the floor. Uh, I talked about how much energy blowers use. Uh, to the extent that you can deliver sensible cooling from the floor or from a surface, and that, by the way, is all you can deliver from, from a major room surface, because as soon as you get it below the dew point temperature, you're going to do some latent cooling and you're going to have a mess. So the, way, the reason you can do it is these surfaces are so large that you can deliver adequate cooling with them at a much warmer temperature than the than the surface temperatures of, a, of an evaporator coil that is what runs in an air conditioning system. So that's beneficial several ways. It can eliminate unnecessary latent cooling. Because if you can deliver 3 quarters of the load radiatively from the floor or from the ceiling, and you need a vapor compression system to satisfy the remaining 25% of the load, it's latent cooling ratio, or its sensible cooling ratio, is going to be about the same as it would have been. And so overall, you're doing a lot less unnecessary latent cooling with the system. But even more importantly, you're saving all the blower energy. You know, you're just running a little pump to move water through the radiant, through tubing that's uh, in contact with your radiant surface. And that's much, much more efficient than, than blowing all that air. But how can you save 60 or 65 percent? Well, the biggest thing is something that you can only do in the West, and that is that much of the time, the water that you're circulating through that tubing in contact with your radiative surface can be evaporatively cooled or radiatively cooled from the night sky. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but it's my favorite, and it's what we do at home. You can get water even cooler by a sky cooling than you can with a cooling tower or evaporative cooling. But with a cooling tower, you can get water plenty cool most of the time in a climate like this to do all the cooling you need from a radiant ceiling or a radiant floor. And you can significantly reduce demand because you don't have to run a compressor as much and because you won't have to be running blowers during the peak cooling time. So lots of bonuses. You, that 60 to 65 percent annual savings can't be achieved in the East where you have more humid conditions, but it's really doable in the West. Well, cooling from the floor. You know, we all know heat rises, and intuitively say, we say, well, won't that, cool, won't that cool just hover down there near the floor, and we won't really, we'll have cold feet, and that's all. Well, there's a very powerful radiative coupling between the surfaces in a room. So the ceiling is warm. What it's doing is radiating heat toward the floor when it's warmer than the floor, and that's equalizing the temperatures. And it will be warmer on top than down below. And there is an issue in office environments, perhaps, where people are pretty stationary and sedentary and nearer the floor, but in a lot of building applications where most people are moving around, cooling the floor works fine. And in, in initial years in our house, we, cool, we have a two-story house and we cool from the second floor ceiling and we 
we heat, we heat radiatively from the downstairs floor and from baseboard convectors on the second floor. But at the start, we cooled from the downstairs floor as well. And my wife finally said, you know, it's always too cold downstairs in the summer. I don't, why, do, why don't we stop that? <laughs> and we did, and it turns out we can cool the downstairs just fine from the upstairs ceiling. But when we did cool from the floor, we didn't find that, you know, our feet were cold and, and the upper portions of our body weren't. So you do get a lot of stirring of air just from motion and it works fine in many environments. And then you can use ceiling fans to enhance the mix and that really solves the problem if there is one. Anyway, uh, yes, natural convection does favor radiative cooling from the ceiling, but it works surprisingly well from the floor in many environments. I use this term low energy cooling, meaning cooling from an evaporative or radiative source. So again, if we can move naturally cooled water, low energy source water through radiant surfaces, we, we really accomplish a lot. There, there are multiple benefits. And one of them is the, is the converse of the one that you hear for radiant heating. How many of you have lived in a radiant heated environment with radiant floors? Well, a few, and you probably love it, right? Could you go back to forced air heating? <laughs> if you have it at home, you can't. It's so much more comfortable. Well, one of the things that it does is reduce in heating season, it reduces the building heat loss because you can set the thermostat lower and as a result, the air temperatures near the ceiling, near the walls, are lower than they would have been with forced air and that means the building loses less heat to the cold outdoors. So you get a load reduction. Well, and, and the, you know, the term mean radiant temperature is, is applied to that concept that, and that also reflects the fact that our indoor comfort is due about half to the average radiant surface, average surface temperature around us and half to the air temperature that we're in. So in summer, when we're cooling, the same is true. If we have a cooler surface in the building because we're forcing water through tube, tubing and cooling that surface, we have a lower average indoor surface temperature and so the mean radiant temperature is lower and you accomplish those same gains. You can then set the thermostat a little higher and that means less heat gain from the outdoors and energy savings as a result. So that last bullet there, that's what I mean by mean radiant temperature advantage. One of, the, one of our first real successes with uh, the WCEC was working with Walmart to generate this much lower cost radiant floor. They had applied radiant floors in two prototype or experimental buildings that they did, one in Denver, one in Texas in 2005 or 2006. They liked the results, but it cost them six or seven dollars a square foot, depending on which building, to install the tubing and the manifolding with conventional radiant heating technology. We'd had this concept at Davis Energy Group back you know, 15 years ago that had kind of been on the shelf and, and when I went and started the cooling center I suggested to Walmart that they consider a much lower cost way to install radiant floor tubing and we brought a manufacturer in. It had been a U.S. company that was bought by a German company, Vega. So we formed this partnership between Walmart, the, the building owner, Vega, the manufacturer, the WCEC, the the implementer and the R&D source, and we developed this rollout system. And the first installation was this one that you're seeing here on a new Walmart store in West Sacramento. We did about a 15,000 square foot pour. It was so successful, that was in February of 2007, that by August, Vega and Walmart were ready to do a full store with this system, and that was completed in Las Vegas. And the store opened, I think, in November or so of, of 2007. And there was a lot of falter all about it because, it, you know, um, Walmart's been doing a lot to try to improve the energy efficiency of, of their stores. But that first store, they finished it 
this uh, tubing and manifolds in place for $2 a square foot. And we think it can come down to a dollar when there's more competition and, and more value engineering and evolution of this system. And even at $2 a square foot, compared with the cost of spotted rooftop units all around the building, it's a pretty nice economic situation. The benef in the West, the benefits are really there. One of the things that Walmart is doing with the radiant floor is pre-cooling. They, they run cooling towers, or actually they're called fluid coolers. They're cooling towers that have a heat exchanger in the sump, so that they have a closed loop system, but all that's going on is the water coming back from the floor is going through a bunch of heat exchange tubing that's being evaporative, indirectly evaporatively cooled by what's essentially a cooling tower, and that cooled water then goes back into the floor. And so they take advantage of the fact that the cooling tower runs best when the wet bulb temperatures are lowest, which is night, morning, and, and they can store that cooling in the slab. The slab and the mass of earth under the slab have a lot of mass and opportunity then for thermal storage cooling. So they can, they can reduce the amount of vapor compression cooling they need through the afternoon by just pre-charging, pre pre-cooling the floor and coasting a bit. And it's been very successful. Um, it is synergistic with ceiling fans. We don't see, the, we don't see Walmart doing that yet, but uh, they might. Um, uh, made, another major point is that cooling gives you some extra bang out of what maybe would have just have been radiant heating technology. Shifting load to pre-peak periods is what I, what I mean by, by pre-charging. Sorry this picture is so fuzzy, but it shows the latest generation of this climate mat product from Vega that Walmart is using. This is going into a, the third or fourth Walmart store, that full store that's used it. And this one was done in Sacramento. But what you see here that, is that um, Vega has a, they've developed a system, a spacer bar system that appears about every four foot along the roll that maintains that six inch spacing that they want between those tubing circuits. So what you have is just a bunch of out and back circuits. Another thing that's going on here that makes this so much less expensive is it uses high density polyethylene tubing instead of cross-linked polyethylene because for cooling and low temperature heating applications, that's all you need. And it's half the price, it's fusible, um, and it's easier to work with for, for any patching that might be necessary. Last thing I wanna talk about is a, a technology approach. It's only applicable to new buildings, which is pretty much true for the radiant floors, but this combines the dual cool type or the advanced rooftop unit technology with radiant floor cooling. This is a project we did though more than 10 years ago in Davis and it just hasn't been followed up on because there's nobody marketing it. Same old story. But it was a new convenience store, 3,600 square feet. Uh, has some fast food outlet facilities in it too, which I know you've seen going on around here as well. 24 hour operation. The base case design had a 15 ton rooftop unit with a five horsepower blower and a fairly large duct system supplying 5,500 CFM of air. And uh, that was about uh, 25, no, about, I guess about 20% ventilation air. What we did was specify that for them instead a 10-ton rooftop unit that had a pre-cooler on it, it pre-cooled ventilation air, and it also had a pump in a sump box that circulated that water through tubing in the floor. So it was a new project is the reason we were able to do that. The project was really successful. It satisfied peak cooling loads with this downsized unit on 112 degree days. It had uh, only about two thirds as much supply air because we were able to reduce the blower speed. The floor cooling allowed the total volume of air to be reduced, lowered the condenser air significantly, a full year simulation that was used after this first, this summer's monitoring concluded that peak demand savings were more than 45% and the annual energy savings would be about 50% and that because of the savings from the downsized rooftop unit and uh, downsized duct work that the payback was less than a year on that first time out. So it's a real opportunity, but it needs someone to market it. 
summarizing the cool floor stuff, uh, I've not talked very much about that key issue that you have to be sure that the water going into the slab is never below the dew point temperature or else you'll get condensation on the floor. Which you don't want. Typical cooling delivery rates are 10 to 15 BTU per hour per square foot and you can increase that a little bit with ceiling fans. Looking at it from the thermal storage standpoint, if you want to compare it to water storage, for example, you get about four ton hours of cooling storage per thousand square foot if you can cycle that slab through a five degree temperature range, which is about what we see. You can get it down to maybe 68 and you can let it rise to about 73 and still have it be delivering useful cooling. So I think I've covered these points enough that I should let you ask questions instead of regurgitating it, but this floor cooling opportunity is really there both in conjunction with advanced rooftop units and just on its own in conjunction with cooling towers, perhaps with chiller backups in the, in the uh, hotter climates that I don't think you have here. Again, what we want to focus on is getting to zero peak cooling in the year 20, by the year 2030. There's a big opportunity to improve our electricity picture and get to a point where, you, where we don't need to build any, any new generators. And a pitch that the cooling center is making very aggressively is that the dollars that you would have spent building new generators, and this is the message to the public utilities commissions and the, and the utilities themselves, if you invest those in technologies that reduce cooling peak demand, you're going to be much better off because not only do you not need to build the generators, you don't need to burn the fossil fuels that would have been used to run those generators to satisfy the cooling loads. Okay, I'm done and, and uh, there is some time, I hope, for questions and I'm happy to stay after if anyone has the energy and doesn't have the appetite yet to go charging out of here toward a dinner table. The uh, Walmart example where they did the whole friggin' floor, was that the only cooling or did they have some rooftop units? They have the ventilation air rooftop units. Those, you, those take advantage of indirect and, and direct evaporative processes to cool both ventilation and condenser air. And then they also have, since that's Las Vegas, pretty hot climate, they have chiller backup. But they did have a problem early in the operation of the store, um, or early in the cooling year, I guess, of 2008, which was the first operating year when the chiller was down. And they carried the total cooling load on a day that was around 110 with the floor cooled only from the indirect evaporative process. So it's, it's very powerful. Um, yeah, I, just a question on, again on the Walmarts. Did they, in the building use, did they have uh, the grocery store use inside one, any of the Walmarts that use that cooling technology or was it just the regular, um, you know, hard These hardwoods? are all super centers, so they all have a, a substantial Food the section between the two, you know, the variants and the loads between the grocery portion and the, the regular store section work out. Was there anything, was there anything strange happening? Between the no, not really. They have been using an evaporative process to cool their refrigeration units, the central refrigeration units that cool the food section of the store for years. And so they did, they did not, I should mention, I said whole store. The super center is about 195,000 square feet total. About 110,000 square feet of that is the so-called general merchandise area. The tubing was not installed in the food section, in the warehouse section in the back, and in the front of the store where they often have rental space to other uh, organizations. Uh, sometimes there's a McDonald's and, you know. But it, it does turn out to be one, and also in the garden center. Uh, they don't, so, or the auto lube section, but it's, it's a nice big rectangle of general merchandise where they use the, the radiant. Uh, question here. How um, effective are other 
um, radiant cooling systems like uh, active chilled beam systems when compared to radiant slab cooling? Well, they are uh, more effective typically. That is, they can usually deliver more uh, cooling BTUs per square foot. Uh, and right now, the reason you don't see more of those is they're fairly expensive. Uh, chilled beams is another technology that the cooling center is, you know, developing a pretty good information base on, but they're being used typically in lead buildings now and, and not in buildings that are, uh, you know, built as routinely as the chain retailers. Do you ever run into problems with moisture inside of the concrete condensing around the, the uh the tubes and damaging the concrete over time within a system like that? No, there had, I mean, these systems, I'm sorry, the question was, do you ever run into problems where moisture gets into the, the slab around the tubing? Because right at that tubing surface is the coldest place in the system. And you could develop a moist slab if that were happening. So what is done is to monitor the, the dew point temperature in the building and be sure that the water that's being inlet to the slab is never at or below the dew point temperature. And with that control, you can't have a problem. Other questions? So are these closed loop systems and do they have anything in the water? I was thinking more of the smaller ones maybe. These are closed loop systems and they're pure water. Yes. And the, you know, they're plastic tube systems, so they aren't subject to corrosion. There are non-ferrous materials throughout the system typically. So if there are, if there are pumps, they're either bronze or stainless impellers and housings. Did I see another question here? Do you have to do anything to get air out of the system? Well, it depends on, on the design. Uh, that, that can be a challenge. Um, but typically, it works quite well if you admit water low, bring it through the plane of the tubing. You definitely want to have a design where the return from the, the uh, tubing itself, as it comes into the return manifold, doesn't have to go down and back up. And uh, there are some systems out there that, in fact, the earliest of the Walmart systems did have both the supply and return manifolds below the level of the tubing. And that was more challenging to get the air out. But now it's a smaller manifold that's in the plane of the tubing. And then those, so there are more couplings that are in the walls above the slab to prevent that problem. It is something you have to be careful with. That's a good question. With, um, typically, if an occupant feels that they have some control over their cooling system, it makes them feel more comfortable. They feel like they have the control to set the thermostat up and down. Um, with a, a radiant floor system, you know, obviously there's a large time delay. You, know, you have to cool down this floor. You can't immediately adjust the temperature. So how do you how do you deal with um, you know temperature swings, or how do you deal with a system that you can't um, quickly change as far as the cooling load goes? Thanks. The, the, the question there was, how do you deal with precise temperature control in different zones of a building with, with radiant cooling systems? And how do you respond quickly to desired changes in comfort conditions? And of course, with a, with a cooled floor mass, on the, the second half of that question, it is more difficult because swinging that whole mass can be challenging. I've engineered a number of very successful systems though with a preferred approach of mine in office scenarios where people want and need zoning wherein the floor is delivering baseload comfort and it's seasonally switched from heating to cooling but it floats for a month in swing seasons at, at change over time each way. And what you have then to supplement the floor is a much smaller fan coil based forced air system with zoned fan coils. 
And ideally, each of those is just delivering ventilation air. But in some scenarios, you need to move more air than that, so you deliver a, a mix of return and, and ventilation air. But ideally, you, you couple a dedicated outdoor air system with that that delivers tempered outdoor air into the return sides of, of these fan coil systems if they do have to deliver more than ventilation air. And those provide precise, fast response pinpoint temperature control. So base load is the approach with the slab itself. And in swing seasons, the loads are low enough, you don't really need the floor. The fan coils can deliver it all as you, as you coast and let the floor come up from its cooled condition in summer to a, a neutral position. And then you start, as you get into the heating season, you start charging that floor. And that way, you avoid all the controls problems with the floor. You just keep the floor, as long as it's the same general use, it's all office, for example. Um, you don't need a complicated control system for the radiant floor. Uh, Question over here. Uh, we are after the hour here. And so what I'm going to do is um, we're going to call it, call it here and then Dick did say he would stay around if you had other questions, but I, I just want to keep us on time as much as possible. It's, it's a good discussion, great questions. Um, so on, on behalf of the, of the Integrated Design Lab, and thank you, Idaho Power and uh, Northwestern Energy. Dick, thank you very much for your presentation. Please stay around, ask questions, but thank you for being here. Well, I